Well, hey, all you wiretappers out there, back here in Studio Gangland Wire. Uh, this is another little story that I have researched on my own. I'm not interviewing anybody. I just find it, I like to find out kind of the story behind the story. Sometimes we all know about John Gotti had Paul Castellano killed and Sammy the Bull helped and it's been told many times and, and we know it was something to do with uh, some tapes that uh, Angelo Quack Quack Ruggiero, uh, the Bureau had taped him and filed a case on him and it was, was going to show that he was dealing drugs. We all know something about that. And, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of you guys know more of the story. And I, and I never really looked much more into the story other than that's the, the, the part that I had always heard. And so I started looking into it. And I used Anthony DiStefano's book, Gotti's Boys, and some other online sources. Well, as I got a little clip from an old interview with a, a woman named Andrea Giovanno, who was married to a Gambino guy and, and dated for a while one of the guys, uh, a guy named Mark Ryder, who was one of the drug dealers that was involved with this uh, Angelo Ruggiero and and probably it, it, we're pretty sure that John Gotti was getting a piece of that action. Matter of fact, you know, he was getting a piece of that action and Paul Castellano did not know about it. So that it's just that, that interview with her is just going to show a little bit about how John Gotti was closely connected to a guy named Mark Ryder reader. Uh, he was a Jewish guy. Uh, anyhow, this story Starts with a plane crash on May the 6th, 1982. Learjet was being piloted. It was a, it was a charter. It was being piloted by a couple of experienced pilots, George Morton and Sherry Day. And they left from Teterboro in New Jersey with a couple named Stephen and Stephanie Terry, T-E-R-I. Uh, this couple was known to the pilots as they had flown them several times back and forth between New Jersey and Florida. What the debt pilots didn't know was that their passengers were really were wanted fugitives or the husband, uh, Stephen Terry, was a wanted fugitive named Salvatore Ruggiero. Uh, and that was his wife, Stephanie Ruggiero. And he was a brother to Angelo Quack Quack Ruggiero. Now, this Learjet took off on a beautiful, cloudless May the 6th morning, head south for the two-hour trip to Orlando. That's pretty cool. He, leave from New Jersey in your own private plane and be in Orlando in two hours. That'd be great. Uh, as this plane started its descent from about 39,000 feet, the last radio contact went dead and air controllers heard some kind of emergency horn in the background. And there were some witnesses. They saw this plane go down. There was a, a charter boat out there uh, off the coast of Florida with a, some sport fishermen. And they just, you know, sat there and watched as a Learjet did a nosedive right into Atlantic off the coast. Actually, it was off the coast of Georgia where it went down. Uh, well, back in New Jersey and New York City, when uh, Mr. Terry, A.K. or Mr. Rosario, A.K. Stephen Terry, didn't check in with anybody by a certain time, phones started lighting up. And, and, you know, with quick messages, hey, get to another phone, get to a phone. That's that's kind of the key is get to a phone. That means go to a, 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 a cool pay phone. And uh, shortly after this plane crashed, that charter boat owner who you know, was in the newspaper, so they knew who he was, and he got a cryptic call from someone, he said, with a Brooklyn accent, and he wanted to charter the guy to take him, take the people out to the exact spot where this plane went down. But the guy said nobody ever showed up for this charter. I assume that, that some of these guys back there thought there was a whole bunch of money in that plane and they needed to get out there and, and find out where it was. And they could die for it and, and get it, I guess. I, you know, you know, big time drug dealer uh, goes out like that, especially headed south. Uh, you know, he might have, you know, a million dollars with him in cash. He's taking the stage somewhere. Anyhow, this news gets around Queens, New York, uh, and Gambino family gangster and a junkyard owner named John, John Carnelia had a serious conversation with a Jewish associate of the Gotti crew named Mark Reeder. Reeder lived upstairs at the old family home of Gotti crew members Angelo and Sal Ruggiero. Now, here's a short snippet from Andrea Giovanno and her experience meeting Mark Reeder and John Gotti. 
a handsome, uh, hard-faced dude. Uh, yeah, he was very handsome. Very, 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 very handsome. I was just out with my friends, and I, uh, you know, they, they were, well, I, I could, like, people like us could recognize other people. Like, I just knew they were street guys. We just, we all could recognize each other, just our mannerisms. Um, but I was out with my sister and my girlfriends, and they sent me over a bottle of Don Perignon. And I sent, oh, it was actually a bottle of Cristal, because John got in like Cristal. And I sent it back. And then when I went on the dance floor, Mark Ryder said, came over and started dancing and he was like, he sent the bottle back. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be bothered. And he was like, you know, um, it's John Gotti. I said, I don't care who he is. Tell him I don't want nothing. But they like that feistiness. They like that, you know, you can handle your own. And then that's actually how I met Mark Ryder, uh, was very persistent, and um, I met John Gotti through him, but I already knew Bruce Cutler because Bruce Cutler was pretty well known, and we used him as an attorney. So I just knew all those guys, you know, through the neighborhood. So th- this Mark Ryder, uh, best I could tell, he already was uh, running a pretty decent size uh, heroin distribution organization. Uh, uh, and, and I have to assume if he can sit with John Gotti, then John Gotti was probably getting a piece of that action. I, I don't know if that ever came out, but uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Oh, his, they, uh, always, they always they, yeah, they, they, Well, they always get a piece of the action. I mean, if you're, you know, they always get, like, kickback from stuff like that. And then, in turn, the Gambino crime family protects those people if they have a problem in the street. So, I mean, they, they all got convicted on the heroin charges. Gene Gotti, uh, I believe um, it was Anthony Coniglia, uh, Mark Ryder, which were all connected to the Gambino crime family. So it's it's of public knowledge that, you know, heroin, uh, actually even Angelo Ruggiero, that was caught on wiretap through DEA and FBI speaking about, you know, heroin and all of that. So... Um, that's all documented that they were getting kicked back from Gambino crime family was getting kicked back from the heroin trafficking. I, 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 I do believe though that, um, John Gotti back in that time frame, the, you know, the whole Gambino crime family, Polly Castellano when he was killed and all of that were the most biggest notorious gangsters as big as Al Capone. I mean, you know, you have tough guys, mobsters in Jersey, Chicago, wherever, but you've not heard of anyone like John Gotti. I mean, when you were to meet John Gotti, and if you ever met him, you would understand the, he walked in a room and, and there was so much charisma just reeking from him. Like, you would just know that he's somebody. Yeah. The way he, you know, presented himself. And, you know, he, here he is, a notorious, cold-blooded killer, and he's on the cover of Time magazine. I don't know of anyone other than Al Capone that got the notoriety or the recognition other than John Gotti. Well, that's interesting. We know Mark Reeder and John Gotti party together, didn't we? Don't we? So, you know, uh, you know how us cops are. We put two of you together. You're you're the mafia. You're You're in some kind of a criminal conspiracy, but that's, you know. I mean, if you're you make your living out of crime and you see part you're seen partying together, you're gonna make your living out of crime together in some manner. Anyhow, uh, now we know from a primary source, Andrea Giovanni, that John Gotti was close to Mark Ryder, and we know that to public documents later on that Mark Reeder was a I keep saying writer or reader. Mark Reeder was a big part of Sal Rosario's drug smuggling operation. Well, now let's go back and look at John Gotti and Angelo Rosario, who was the brother to this drug dealer, Salvatore Rosario. Gotti first met the uh, Rosario brothers when they were teenagers, and and he was being bullied for being poor and and not having very decent clothes. Kind of explains maybe when he got successful in life, he wore nothing but the best clothes. But he and the Rosario earned their reputation with their fists, and pretty soon by the time they were full-fledged, middle to later teens, they had what they called the Fulton Rockaway gang. 
And this gang was so bad, they earned the notice of Gambino underboss Anello Della Croce. I think they call him Neil, I believe, uh, Della Croce. Uh, Gotti and the Fulton Rockaway gang would be directed to join uh, Capo Carmine Fatico's club, club, his uh, crew, which operated out of the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, which Gotti will eventually, you know, accede or uh, get promoted up to be the capo of that crew and his headquarters would be the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. These guys, when they were young, know his uh, Gotti and his uh, Rogerio brothers crew and some other guys, they earned a reputation as a go-to guys. There was nothing they would do and, and do it right and do it well and get it done. Uh, when Fadiko went to prison, John Crotty, Gotti took over his crew. And it was about this time that uh, he was made in the Gambo Gambino crime family. Uh, Angelo Rosario stayed close to rising mob star John Gotti, while Sal Rosario drifted off into another path. Uh, during the later 60s and into the 1970s, Sal Rosario very quietly on the down low and away from your normal mob connections and built a large heroin distribution organization. And he stayed off the radar of Carlo Gambino and off a of law of the uh, radar of law enforcement. Somehow, I don't know how, but he did. Uh, during this time, the FBI and the DEA were pretty, and the New York City Intelligence Unit were pretty much preoccupied with the Bonanno family and the Zips, the Sicilian Zips and the Pizza Connection and uh, uh, what's his name? The Cigar, uh, Galente, that, that murder, that, there was a lot of action going on there. And, uh, and so they were really focused on that Pizza Connection case. And I did a, like a two or three part four part, maybe series on the pizza connection case. And it was, it was huge. And it stretched as we know, clear to back to Sicily and, and middle East. And, and they took down people from here to Sicily. So uh, that took all of their attention. Now this Sal Rogerio, he, he, when he was younger, he was a real fit guy. He was addicted to anything like fast motorcycles and stolen cars. And, and he had a really bad bike wreck, I think at one time. And that seemed to, to help with his impulse control and take away his need for speed. I still have a little need for speed myself. Um, now his brother, Quack Quack Rosario had become really close with John Gotti and uh, was in that crew and working with him every day. And, and those two, uh, Angelo and, and Quack Quack and, and John Gotti made their bones together and they took a murder conviction. They, they were in a little crew that was given the orders by Carlo Gambino and, and Dele, well, through Della Croce to kill an Irish gangster named McBratney. Now, McBratney had been involved in kidnapping Gambino family associates for ransom. And they, they tracked him down. They caught him in a bar and, and it kind of went sideways on him a little bit. There was another guy that actually pulled the trigger and, but they were all involved in this murder and somebody got away and out of that barn called the cops and, and they made cases on them. And like I said, Gotti and Rogerio kept their mouth shut and took the murder conviction for killing that Irish gangster. So it was around this time in the early 1970s that Sal Rogerio caught a case and went underground. That's when he started living the life of a, uh, actually what he did is he, he, he lived the life of a millionaire businessman as a cover kind of both to the cops and, and really as a cover for uh, uh, against the mob because he did not want Carlo Gambino to know that he was dealing all these drugs and Gotti and Ruggiero or nobody around him wanted Castellano who had taken over as boss during this time in 1976 to know that he was dealing drugs and, and had a huge drug business. Uh, you know, when, when, uh, Paul Castellano was promoted, and this is a pretty well-known fact, that uh, Della Croce really was the man who had been there the longest and, and had the most street cred. Castellano didn't have that much street cred. He had some, uh, some blood relations going for him there. Uh, and Gotti always took it as kind of a personal affront and did not agree that Della Croce was not uh, the new boss of the Gambino crime family. But, you know, everybody... Della Croce, he understood, as you'll hear him say, he understands that somebody's the boss and other people take orders from the boss. Some people believe that 
Carlo Gambino knew that Castellano would continue to take the family more in the direction of white collar crimes, which are much more lucrative many times and much less dangerous and carry less uh, uh, egregious sentencing than the usual loan sharking, extortion, narcotics, you know, robberies, uh, big time burglaries, fencing, those kinds of things. Uh, uh, the white collar stuff is is, uh, you know, getting involved with the unions and, and the concrete club they had to make a lot of money out of that with with not so much dirty business going on. And so you keep the you, you don't have the public on your butt and no headlines. And so the feds aren't on you all the time. But during this time, during the 70s, Sal Rosario is secretly sending money to Carmine Fatico, who was Gotti's capo at the Bergen Hutton. Hunt and Fish Club. This all came out of his heroin operation. Now, they would tell people, Fatico would tell people on the surface that this was money from hijacking trucks from the JFK airport. And when Fatico will go to jail, Gotti takes over the crew and he's going to take over this money too. Uh, that's what set the scene for the demise of Paul Castellano, really. Uh, Gotti is an ambitious young mobster who believes that his mentor, Della Croce, was betrayed. Uh, of course, Del Croce has never complained publicly about the fact that Gambino passed him over uh, and he just dutifully remained the underboss in charge of all the lower level street criminal activities like Gotti preferred. Gotti liked the street crime stuff. Sal Rosario keeps expanding his heroin distribution network. He takes in his brother, Angelo, and this Mark Reeder, who was also known as the Jew. Uh, other Gambino associates go to work for him because there's so much money in it. I mean, Jesus, there's so much money in drugs. I don't know how if you're a criminal, you, you stay out of it. This guy builds a hell of an empire. He has a mansion in New Jersey. He has houses in Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio. He has a cabin in the Poconos. He starts trading stocks and bonds. He lives that life of that uh, rich businessman. A lot of expensive cars. He owns a diner. He has a greeting card store somewhere, a lot of other investment property. And, you know, when he was on his way to Orlando and, and when the jet went down, he was going down there to negotiate with Disney World to uh, get a McDonald's franchise on the inside there. So, I mean, this guy, you know, he's one of those guys that he should have just walked away from all that after he got all these businesses set up because he can run a business. Uh, kind of his his other people around him were drawing law enforcement attention. He wasn't, but some of these other people were. were. And, and here's one, Mark Reeder and Angelo, Angelo Ruggiero, they got involved with Nicky Barnes. Now, the most well-known flamboyant New York heroin kingpin was a black man named Leroy Nicky Barnes. He had pictures of him wearing these, you know, hundred thousand dollar coats and you know million dollars in jewelry and and had big fancy cars and and was just out there well when you're out there like that cops are all over you they can do anything they can to take you down it's like you're you know when you're a cop it's like they're throwing it up in your face uh, of course he gets popped and he's now got a life sentence he's in marion but he's authorized his wife a woman named thelma grant to buy heroin from mark reader and angelo rosario uh, Thelma Grant would later testify she only knew them as a Jew and the Italian. Uh, but agents were able to connect Reader and Rosario to many heroin transactions here with uh, Nikki Barnes's wife. Uh, they already had some electronic surveillance in there on Rosario. Uh, they'd been aided by a Gotti associate and long term deep throat source Willie Boy, Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson to give more information about Rosario because he hated Rosario. Uh, they said that Johnson even gave them the layout of uh, Rosario's home and suggested the best place to put microphones where they might meet and have talks. Uh, this installation was made kind of famous if you saw that documentary on Netflix, Fear City. And I had this agent that did that installation. He's in one of my, I had him on the podcast. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. 
uh, you know, and that's the one he did the installation. Rogerio was really suspicious and they, they messed up his phone and his cable TV. And so he goes inside and Rogerio standing over his so- shoulder the whole time watching, but he's able to slip a microphone inside the cable TV setup where that would be the best place. And, and they, you know, you don't have to go inside the house to, to, uh, wiretap the phone. You just do that flip of the switch now at the, uh, telephone company anymore. If there's digital stuff, you don't even have to climb the pole like they used to back in the olden days. You know, and after Angelo was notified about his brother's death, he and Gene Gotti and John Cornelia immediately went to Salvatore Rosario's hideout in Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, searching for a yet to be sold shipment of heroin and a bunch of cash. It was a stash house he had out there. Now, they already had his phone wired up. I mean, they had microphones in his kitchen in the end, his den, his dining room, his telephone. The the monitoring agents were able to overhear and record Angelo's attorney offering condolences about the death of Sal, Angelo's brother, and then saying Gene found the heroin. Of course, you know, antenna went up big time. Gene found the heroin. So this prior investigation into Angelo Rosario suddenly held a lot of promise leading to indictments of a major crime family, a Gambino crime family member, and maybe more than one member. So he said, Gene, you know, Gene Gotti, uh, Paul Gotti gets into this somewhere too, I believe. Uh, Angelo was a constant chatterbox and, and a lot of running commentary on everything going on around him. And everybody that visited him had to sit and listen to him going on and on with endless gossip and complaints and and just other things that that should not be said out loud. Uh, The death of his brother, Sal, hit him pretty hard, and and he was often heard on the wiretaps wistfully speaking about his brother and some of his brother's drug trafficking partners. by 1986, the FBI has put together a heroin distribution case and charged uh, Angelo Rosario. Paul Castellano's getting his own problems about this time, and he's gotten word about this case, and it's, they, he understands it might, it's about narcotics distribution, but doesn't know much about it. John Gotti know, pretty well knows all about it, and he also knows his brother Gene Gotti was involved, and he'll be on the tapes. And he also, Paul, De, Paul Castellano wants his hands on this tapes. Uh, once he gets his hands on the tapes, uh, John Gotti knows that he'll more than likely have to kill his friend, Angelo Quack Quack Rosario, and his brother will not be looking so good either. Uh, by August 1983, the FBI has put together all their indictments for this heroin smuggling case, and they're going to charge Angelo, Angelo Rosario, Gene Gotti, John Carnelia, and 10 other people with smuggling hundreds of pounds of white Asian heroin from Southeast Asia. And all the defendants were either members or associates of Gotti's crew. At first, John Gotti tries to pass it off. Just, you know, his brother, Angelo, you know, Quack Quack's a good guy. He's just trying to clean up the remains of his deceased brothers, Salvatore Ruggiero's drug operation. And none of this really touches, you know, me or anybody in my crew. Uh, but <laughs> Paul Castellano is not so sure about that. Now, the FBI has not identified any of the defendants as members of any organized crime family, but anybody in the know, when they see the names, would get it. Uh, Castellano is now realizing that he should not have left Gotti unwatched quite so much. And, and, and Della Croce, his underboss, who was responsible for Gotti mainly, uh, should have watched him a little closer. So he calls him in. He tells God, he said, you better be able to prove you weren't involved with this drug operation. And, and he knows about the tapes. And he said, you know, let's, let's get those tapes. You tell him, we, we, I want to hear those. I want to listen to those tapes. I want to see those transcripts. Well, about the same time is coming out and, and Paul Castellano's got trouble and they have bugged his house. And what they didn't know yet, or nobody knew exactly except the Bureau, that Quack Quack Rosario, what the Bureau was picking up, and it gave him probable cause to get into Castellano's house because he would go, Rosario would go to Big Polly's house and talk my business 
And then he'd go back home and he had his bug phones and his microphones. He would talk to other Gotti crew members and bragging about everything that he knew and everything he talked about with Big Polly. Kind of, hey, little look at me. I'm really in, you know, whether he had him come over to the house or talk to him on the phone. Well, this information here gave the FBI kind of the final nail that put into an affidavit for this microphone surveillance inside Castellano's house. And this is all going to come out. It's all, you know, they wouldn't have got in his house, I don't think, except for Rogerio talking about, you know, I said this, Big Polly said that, Big Polly said this, that was over at his house. You know, dirty conversation, no other way to overhear it, no other way to make a case, put a, put a microphone in. Uh, well, by 1985, the commission case indictments have been issued and Castellano was arrested on that case. And, and the commission, uh, the RICO, and as uh, well as you know, the predicate offenses here was probably his stolen car operation that Roy DeMeo had been running. And they were going to be able to show that Castellano was a boss and reprofit took profits from DeMeo's operation. You know, the predicate offense of stolen cars and then, you know, take down the whole operation under using RICO. Uh, Paul Castellano is pushing Gotti for the tapes and, and Gotti's resisting, but he kind of acting like he wants to help and uh, God, he's hearing that Castellano is just going to clean house at the Bergen Hits Fish and Hunt Club. And, and so he's got to make some effort here and to please to, to, to satisfy Castellano. So he, he, Della Croce is on his deathbed. He's at home on his deathbed. He orders Ruggiero to meet him over there. And, and then we're going to talk about how he's got to give up these tapes. At least they can put it back onto him, I guess, or at least Della Croce. You know, I, I don't, I don't know. You never know what's in these guys' minds. Now I've got, I got found on YouTube and I picked up a, a, a recorded this tape, a little short bit that somebody's found. I can't even remember who it was. Um, and notice that Della Croce's voice is the one that's barely understandable, but they're both telling Ruggiero that he must give up the tapes. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to uh, get a transcript on it. So you'll be able to see exactly what they say. I'm going to tell you something. If you two never bother with me again, again, the rest of my life, I ain't giving up that stuff. I can't. I can't. There's good friends of mine on the fucking face. Well, he's a boy. You have to do what he tells you, man. See, that's why I said to you before, you, you don't understand what the money is. It also means that the boss is your boss. You understand? Gotti knows if Castellano... If his lawyers get their hands on Rogerio tapes, then he and his probably his brother and maybe and other members of his crew are maybe dead men. They're really going to be in a huge amount of trouble, and especially when it comes out one of his guys helped with the probable cause on Castellano's house unknowingly, but he, they help. These guys are all been tight for a long time. It's well known fact now that John Gotti started plotting the death of. Gambino crime family boss, Paul Castellano, as he set him up, as he pulled up and got out of his car to go to a meeting or a dinner or something at Spark Steakhouse in Manhattan. And they pop him while Sammy the Bull and John Gotti sit across the street. He has two or three other guys pop him and his driver, too. And I, I don't remember all those names. I just, I just wanted to, to tell you all the story of where this all came from. You know, what happened before the, the, the sequence of events that set this uh, in motion that ended up with the death of Paul Castellano. So that was uh, that's the story. And, and I appreciate you all listening to me and making comments and, and tell a friend about the podcast. That's that's one of the big ways you can help me is tell a friend about the podcast. There's other ways you can. Donate a little money and uh, don't forget to look out for motorcycles because, you know, I ride a motorcycle and I'm like Salvatore Ruggiero. I have the need for speed sometimes. Uh, and if, uh, if you have any problems with PTSD and if you're a vet, why go check out the uh, online uh, Veterans Administration. They have a hotline and, and that can help you quite a little bit. So thanks a lot, guys. 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 So,